Good gabi po sa ating lahat. Good evening everyone. Well, good afternoon, but it's almost evening. I am Natsi Africa Verseles from the Department of Women and Development Studies and I'm also a member of the Doctor of Social so, Development. Po oh, yes po. I'm also a member of the Doctor of Social Development DSD committee. Okay, we're admitting more participants into the room. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon evening. We acknowledge the presence of our Dean, Professor Polotan de la Cruz. Also, Dr. Justin Nicolas is here, who is the director of our DSD program. Members of the DSD and faculty of the DSD program, DSD students, and our registered participants from the following organizations. And I hope you're all here already. The UP Diliman Gender Office, the Asian Solidarity Economy Councilor ASEC, Patama Bawais and Homelet Philippines, Kababaihan Samahan ng Maki Makiling Bato Organization, Lakas, Homenet Philippines, Redeems, Homenet Philippines again, UPCSWCD, ASCII Foundation Inc., ASAFIL K4 Network, UPCIDS Program on Alternative Development, various transport cooperatives. We also have the Sustainable Development Network Malaysia or SUSDEN Malaysia, UPDAS, UP Visayas, UP Manila, AIMS, Bulacan State University, JSWAP, Central Luzon, and the Bulacan State University main campus in Malolos. Welcome everyone to the first lecture of the 2023 Doctor of Social Development Lecture Series entitled Accelerating Progress Towards the SDGs Through the Social Solidarity Economy. This DSD event is part of the College of Social Work and Community Development College Week, which began this morning. And to deliver the opening remarks, it is my pleasure to introduce our indefatigable Dean, Professor Tata Polotan de la Cruz. Dean Tata, you have the virtual floor, Po. Thank you. Thank you, dear Natsi. And thank you for the indefatigable. Hirap nung ispel uh, introduction. Uh, this is going to be quick so that we could give more time to our esteemed uh, speaker. So, magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Uh, on behalf of the College of Social Work and Community Development, I welcome you all to the first lecture of a five-part series of our uh, College Week celebration. Tunay na napapanahon ang napiling paksa ng DSD Program Committee para sa hapong ito. Uh, accelerating progress towards the attainment of SDGs through social solidarity economy. I did a quick Google uh, of what SSE is and this is what I found no? from an introduction uh, of the book uh, SSE Beyond the Fringes edited by Peter Utting and published by SED in 2015. Sabi niya, as economic crisis, growing inequality, and climate change prompt a global debate on the meaning and trajectory of development, increasing attention is focusing on the social and solidarity economy as a distinctive approach to sustainable and rights-based development. While we are beginning to understand what SSE is, what it promises, and how it differs from business as usual, we know far less about whether it can really move beyond the fringe status in many countries and regions. Under what conditions can social and solidarity economy scale up and scale out? That is expand in terms of the growth of SSE organizations and enterprises or spread horizontally within given territories. So I think uh, this evening's discussion uh, can contribute to the questions raised in the book uh, and promises to be a critical and enlightening one. I invite you to listen to our esteemed resource person Dr. Ben Quinones, who is also a lecturer, 
uh, of the DSD program this semester, who is a leading thinker and practitioner of SSE. I also invite you to take part in the discussion after. Maraming salamat sa DSD program, or committee, DSD program committee for organizing this forum at maraming salamat sa inyong pagdalo. Magandang gabi sa ating lahat. Thank you very much po, Dean Tata. Actually, we are hoping that the SSE will become more mainstreamed in the college because it is actually an alternative economy that we should right. all be getting into already. So we're really grateful that we have, again, that SSE class by Dr. Ben Quinones. This is actually the second time he'll be teaching or he's teaching this class. So thank you, Dean. So we're very fortunate to have with us a speaker, Dr. Benjamin R. Quinones Jr. Dr. Quinones, or I actually call him Kuya Ben, is president and CEO of Farmers Bazaar Fintech Philippines, or FBFP Inc. Dr. Ben Quinones founded the Asian Solidarity Economy Council, or ASEC, which is the continental network in Asia of the Intercontinental Network for the Promotion of Social Solidarity Economy, or RIPES. He established the Coalition of Socially Responsible SMEs in Asia that pioneered the development of community-based and social enterprises while serving as its program coordinator of the Intergovernmental Organization Asian and Pacific Development Center, APDC, in Kuala Lumpur from 1996 to 2003, which is affiliated with UNSCAP. Dr. Quinones developed and pilot tested in India, Indonesia, Nepal, Philippines, and Thailand, the self-help group linkage banking program while serving as Secretary General of the Asia Pacific Rural and Agricultural Credit Association or APRACA in Bangkok, Thailand from 1985 to 1993, which is a regional body established by UNFAO. Dr. Quinones holds a PhD in organization development from the Southeast Asia Interdisciplinary Development Institute, Graduate School of Organization Development and Planning, and a Master of Science in Agricultural Economics from the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. So friends, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Ben Quinones. Kuya Ben, please take the thank virtual floor. Thank you, Dr. Latsi, and uh, thank you, Professor Lenore de Polotan de la Cruz, for gracing this event with your presence. Uh, thank you, Rinpo, okay, uh, Dr. Justin, for making this event happen, and to all participants, uh, also the students of BST of the UP College Social Work Community Development. Magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. Uh, Magsishare po ako ng aking uh, screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Can you make it full slideshow po? Ayan. Thank you. Okay. Actually, I have three uh, lectures, but uh, I am constrained to deliver this uh, before 7.30. So what I'll do is, depending on the moderator, uh, after... Uh, the my lecture you can raise questions but there are two kinds of questions that would be discussed in the seminar the first are the questions from the participants the second is a general question for uh discussion uh, of all participants that would be raised by the moderator uh, and uh, i will be uh, sharing that also in my uh, powerpoint presentation so uh the first uh uh, lecture is really on uh, this uh, the global uh, crisis. Just a moment, I cannot take this. Uh, okay. The uh, global crisis and problems confronting uh, the nations. Okay. Uh, I, I thought that first uh, we need to discuss uh, what we mean or what uh, and we understand about capitalist system and the free market system. 
uh, because they are often uh, used interchangeably, uh, only because uh, they are both based on the uh, law of supply, what is called the law on supply and demand. Uh, the law of supply and demand is the basis for determining the price uh, of goods and services and the production of goods and so the level of production of goods and services. But these two are uh, the two types of economic systems. Uh, capitalism is, uh, you know, um, economic system uh, where the uh, means of production are owned by individuals or businesses. And uh, uh, the level and price of uh, goods to be produced are determined by supply and demand. Now, capitalism is a for, also a form of free market economy in the sense that it relies on property rights of individuals. And uh, these rights are normally protected by the laws of the land. And um, uh, the, uh, um, this uh, type of uh, system uh, is uh, very much uh, popular in what is called uh, developed and developing countries. Now, the uh, free market economies, uh, when we say free market, it means to say that there are no government intervention or interception in the economy. Uh, there are no rules, regulations that uh, bind uh, businesses uh, that govern or regulate their transactions. Uh, so the concept of free market uh, means to say that uh, it's only the, the, the price mechanism that determines the supply and demand. Uh, it's not controlled by the government. There are no laws that uh, govern it. But you see, uh, uh, the price mechanism does not always uh, work well. It can lead to market fa failure. You know? uh, in most cases, the market is free only in name, yeah? free on name only. Uh, because uh, in most cases, there are cartels, like, uh, you know, the onion cartel. In fact, the Philippine economy is controlled by cult cartels, you know. Uh, so this is one of the uh, notions that are uh, often used by politicians just to show that, uh, you know, we are democratic and uh, we are not a socialist economy. Now... Uh, it's quite important to understand uh, how this system of capitalism has uh, risen to become, uh, uh, to give rise to what is called the neoliberal market economy. Yeah? So we go back to history, uh, the 1930s, because the most uh, dominant economy then was the United States economy, and there was a great depression in the U.S., and in order to overcome uh, the depression because people are losing their jobs, uh, the uh, US uh, president uh, initiated what is called the New Deal, meaning to say the government intervened and uh, created jobs. Uh, they uh, were of the government was offering uh, work to people who have no jobs. They dig, uh, they dug ditches and they are given salaries so that you know they're able to have money in order to buy goods. Uh, now, there was a school called Chicago School of Economics that was against this uh, government intervention because they thought that uh, this uh, kind of uh, intervention violates the uh, law of supply and demand. Uh, so uh, these hard right economists were really campaigning against this uh, policy. And then the oil shock in the 1970s gave them the opportunity to push this uh, uh, criticism against uh, the uh, what is also called the Kenshan, you know, Kenshan uh, economics, and replace it with uh, the notion of a deregulated economy. Yeah? So the deregulation became the mantra of this uh, Chicago School of Economics. Uh, that means to say removing, you know, the uh, control and participation or uh, regulation of the government on uh, economy. So basically, uh, this uh, uh, deregulation uh, 
kept the hands of the government out of business. Uh, so what happened was that uh, governments were uh, encouraged to give up their uh, ownership and control of public utilities, uh, to um, give up their uh, participation and uh, management of uh, public health uh, uh, institutions and so forth. Now, this deregulation under the Clinton and Blair era, it further developed into globalization. And globalization is uh, uh, the concept of um, uh, where, you know, this, um, uh, what has been achieved at the national level of deregulation, uh, this concept was spread throughout the uh, world, especially through the developing countries with the use of uh, International Monetary Fund and World Bank that uh, financed the cascading of this uh, deregulation process. So what happened was that there were multinational agreements that were initiated uh, between the, uh, 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 the multinational transnational corporations and uh, the uh, nation states. And uh, uh, these international uh, agreements, multinational agreements, uh, became a, uh, a kind of ban, bandage you know, to nation states uh, because uh, it created a, uh, uh, the uh, neoliberal market economy that is independent of the nation states. So you see, for the first time in history, uh, this uh, neoliberal market economy is not embedded in the local economies. It is an economy that is that exists outside the control and power of nation states. That's why it says that uh, this is a kind of uh, market economy created by most multinational agreements and uh, nation states cannot escape from this uh, regime because they are bound by it at the same time, they cannot influence or change it. So it is a very frustrating situation, but the point is, it is something that exists outside of the power and control of nation states. And so nation states are not able to control or change it. So imagine this neoliberal market economy existing outside the realm of the uh, national economies. And it is, uh, controlling you know, the uh, uh, movement of uh, resources. And uh, uh, in, in one of my papers, I was, say, I was uh, noting that uh, prior to the 1970s, prior to 1960s, we still have this uh, subsistence economy in the Philippines. Uh, so uh, people were, uh, in the 1960s, uh, people were, uh, not very rich or poor, but uh, they are, they, are, they, they, are, they can avail of uh, their needs locally. Uh, but after 1970s, local economies became part of the global supply chains of multinational, uh, transnational corporations. So, uh, and this uh, type of uh, transnational corporations are beyond the reach of uh, uh, nation states, they cannot be sued. And if, for example, nation, uh, the national governments, the governments uh, go against uh, the uh, uh, interest of the transnational corporations, they can go to these international settlements and uh, uh, accuse the government of uh, uh, interference. So, uh, this uh, economic system uh, controlled by the multinational uh, transnational corporations, uh, the, the global economy became their plaything. You know? So uh, if they want to uh, minimize the cost of uh, the production of a particular product, for example, car, uh, they will now choose countries. Yeah? 
where they will uh, produce certain parts, uh, but they control the pattern. Yeah? So for example, car manufacturers may uh, put uh, the uh, production of uh, certain parts in one country, another part in another country, uh, but they control the market and the pattern. Yeah? So developing countries are simply uh, you know, uh, sources uh, of raw materials and uh, products of cheap labor. So uh, the uh, kind, this kind of economy has uh, created a lot of problems uh, for uh, national uh, developing countries. And uh, they cannot do anything much because uh, um, the, uh, you know, whatever, for example, if uh, let's say uh, uh, you try, you know, to uh, create your own source of energy, yeah, uh, that really that does not make any uh, a problem at all, you know, for the uh, oil companies, yeah. Uh, so they will just do their thing. And uh, if they want to raise the prices of oil, they can do so. Uh, and there's nothing that we can do about it. Now here, you can see that uh, uh, it is uh, estimated that uh, uh, inflation in any country, around 60% of that goes to the profits of this transnational corporation. So if, for example, the Philippines records a uh, inflation rate of 8%, 7, 8%, 60% of that uh, is comprised of the profits of transnational corporation. So this is how we arrive at the concept of economic sovereignty. Yeah? At, the, uh, uh, at present, the concept of economic sovereignty is uh, no longer discussed, you know, even in uh, economics. Huh? Why? Because uh, we don't have the power, the governments have the power uh, to really uh, protect themselves from the onslaught of transnational corporations. Yeah? So this is why one of the uh, issues that we're going to discuss after this lecture is uh, what can people do in the midst of this uh, uh, quandary that uh, the gov our government is not in a position to oppose the interests of transnational cooperation. Uh, so the big question for us is what, what can the people do? Uh, what is their alternative? Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> now, uh, according to Brid Brennan, the ideology of neoliberalism has become the almost supreme dogma of our times. It promotes the mantra of liberalization, privatization, and competitive endless growth as the only frame of economy. So that's why uh, GDP growth is uh, being uh, touted, you know, is the main uh, uh, indicator of development in countries. Uh, if, for example, your GDP growth is negative, zero or negative, that means to say that your economy is not doing that. And this is what is called endless growth because you are supposed to grow endlessly. You're supposed to show positive growth every year, year in and year out. That is the uh, uh, framework that is the model of development uh, of, uh, uh, that is uh, promoted by the neoliberal market economy. And uh, the sad thing is that uh, economists don't occur uh, without uh, using natural resources. So the environment is depleted, the uh, natural resources are being depleted and uh, for the sake of this ended growth model. Now, um, so as I have mentioned a while ago, uh, this uh, international settlement of investment disputes, uh, this is the uh, uh, instrument used by uh, the corporations if they want to uh, uh, discipline any government that goes against their interest. Yeah. Now, so what, what has uh, this neoliberal market economy brought uh, to uh, countries like the Philippines? 
Uh, so according to UNESCO, in spite of the fact that for the past over 20, 50 years, uh, the developed countries have spent $2.3 billion on foreign aid to help countries like the Philippines develop and grow their economy. Yet 10% of the world's population, some 730 million, live in extreme poverty of less than 190 $1 cents per day. Uh, several millions of children are uh, suffering, uh, and uh, there are so many uh, people who do not have uh, water and so forth. So uh, many children are out of school. All these problems have been created uh, by the neil market economy because uh, you see, uh, they um, took the uh, power and, uh, and uh, control of the government over uh, social protection measures. Uh, they liberated education system and uh, allowed the uh, market uh, mechanism to determine uh, who can access education, who can access uh, finance, who can access um, um, insurance, uh, and so forth and so on. So those who cannot afford to uh, buy these uh, uh, mechanisms uh, to protect for social protection are not uh, protected. Yeah? So this is the uh, sad thing about this neoliberal market economy. Now, uh, uh, this is the last part of my lecture. Uh, the uh, globalization has brought uh, what Benson calls 10 inequalities. The first is income inequality. And uh, there is uh, uh, the poorest 50% of the global population share 8.5% of, of the global income, uh, reaches 10% earn over 50%. And uh, well, there's also wealth inequality. And uh, the World Bank uh, study shows that the Philippines still struggles to close one of the widest inequality, wealth inequality in, this, uh, in, in Asia. The third kind of inequality is regional inequality. Uh, the cities, uh, you have uh, more uh, wealth concentrated in cities and uh, the rural areas are getting poor and poorer. Interregional inequality, there's also inequality of opportunity and uh, the rich and powerful have uh, greater opportunities, access to uh, opportunities and lesser for poor people. There is inequality of representation. Uh, the uh, rich and the, the elite have more access uh, being represented in uh, the uh, centers of power. Uh, they are also uh, have access to the protection of law. Inequality employment, Inequality of behavior. You see, uh, the um, uh, this uh, how do you call this um, uh, businesses? Yeah, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, the law protects the interests of uh, uh, the businesses. Yeah, uh, business interests. And uh, uh, compared, you know, to the interest of the people, uh, they have the little uh, justice uh, uh, within this uh, neoliberal mechanism. Inequality of power, of course, big business have more power compared to uh, the uh, small businesses. In the Philippines, we have. Uh, 92% uh, of our enterprises are micro and small. There's a lot of laws that uh, purport to provide uh, development aid to micro and small enterprises, but uh, uh, really the big bulk of resources uh, in our country are 
captured uh, by the big business. For example, universal commercial banks uh, control uh, something like 98% of the total deposits uh, of the banking system, and only 2% is uh, in the hands of rural banks and cooperative banks. And these banks are supposed to be uh, catering to micro and small enterprises. Uh, but even then, among these uh, cooperative and rural banks, they cater to what is called the rich uh, or the uh, entrepreneurial poor. And of course, inequality of accountability. Uh, it, it is uh, very difficult you know, to make the big uh, corporations accountable, but uh, poor people, they can easily be brought to court. So uh, for our general discussion, uh, really the question for us is, what can be done by the people to achieve economic sovereignty when the state is bound by multinational, agree multinational agreements, which uh, they are bound, but they cannot change it or control it. Yeah? They cannot even influence it. So uh, given that uh, kind of situation, um, is it you know, uh, worthwhile to uh, present our proposals for developing the economy, developing the country, present it to the government when the state is not, you know, uh, free uh, to react or to do something about any proposal that will lead to economic sovereignty. So this is our dilemma, and of course, uh, we we uh, we have to um, really think hard about any alternative that might be uh, presented to the people that will allow them to uh, restructure the economy and uh, struggle for economic sovereignty. So I will end my lecture here. If there are questions, I would like to, I can answer them. And then uh, later on, it, it's up to the moderator, but I can, I can continue the next lecture because it's uh, related to this lecture. It's about the problems created by this uh, new environment market economy. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Natsi. Thank you very much, Dr. Ben Quinones. So are there any questions for Dr. Quinones on the first part of his lecture that you would like him to answer before he proceeds? Because he could proceed already to the next part. Kuya Ben, can you answer your discussion question for us? Actually, this is the uh, third part of my lecture. You know, the reason why I raised this question is because I'd like you to think. You know, if this is uh, the situation right now, it's like uh, you know a subsong situation. Every move you 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 make uh, makes your position worse. And yeah? so, what is really the alternative? What kind of alternative economy or structure are you going to pursue? And uh, this is why, you know, uh, the uh, case of social society economy is worth uh, looking into. Yeah? Because it is a kind of economy that is not, that is autonomous of the uh, state as well as the for-profit private corporate sector. Yeah? So this question really is a leading question uh, because you see, if you don't understand that uh, the neoliberal market economy has really cap held our economy captive because it is independent and autonomous of the uh, laws and regulations of the country. It uh, functions over and above uh, the laws and regulations of the country. And yet, uh, you know, it uh, makes use of our uh, cheap, cheap labor to produce the products uh, that uh, they needed for their own uh, uh, astro materials or uh, inputs you know, for their own products. So to me, the answer really is uh, SSE. SSE, yeah? Social, the people in you know, <laughs> SSE. Yeah, because, but just, yeah, but very quickly, Kuya Ben. Yes. I'm, I'm actually quite interested in your um, views on how 
we can, as an SSE advocacy group, counter this very hegemonic context that we are operating in. Because are we able to achieve economic sovereignty by pushing the SSE when we are still controlled by larger powers economically? Well, uh, you know, the only uh, thing that can be done is to organize. Yeah? Uh, because if you pro propose any uh, legislation, yeah, um, that will not uh, uh, matter much. You know? So that's why the uh, motto of uh, social studies economy is resist and build. Yeah? You resist any form of oppression, but at the same time, build the alternative. You cannot resist and just you know, demonstrate and then uh, present the government with your petition and then nothing. You don't do anything to create an alternative. Yes. So this is why uh, the people can really undertake autonomous uh, actions independent of uh, the government and as well as the for-profit corporate sector. Yeah. So this is why uh, autonomy and independence of economic actions by the people are very, very important. Although we do not uh, discourage uh, the SEC entities to work with local governments that are sympathetic to their cause. Yeah? In fact, uh, the uh, attitude should be to win over both uh, the state and the corporate sector to the side of SSE. That is the that is the uh, you know the goal, uh, because it is only by making them see the importance of uh, the initiative of SEC in creating you know uh, uh, an economy that can uh, work against the neoliberal market economy, where they can really uh, create a, an alternative and uh, a strong um, a strong uh, resistance to the neoliberal market economy. Yes, thank you, Kuya Ben. I see a hand raised. Yes. John, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Professor Benjamin, thank you for the lecture. I I'm, st I'm still trying to grasp the context and the, and the realities that pushes the 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 global crisis no, as, as you were referring sir would you would you say that as part of the the resistance and the struggle of the people to create a solution would you say that uh it contributes to the development of the informal sector the informal economy Kasi in a way, uh, it's it's like a, the resistance of the people. Uh, ayaw na namin maki-register dyan. Ayaw na namin makibayad ng taxes. Mag-informal sector na lang tayo. Although, of course, we know that uh, the informal sector contributes to a lot of uh, social problems that we are already discussing. But uh, just trying co to connect the concepts, uh, would you say that... Uh, the 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 search for the people for an alternative especially the grassroots this contributes to the uh to the, the creation no? to the development of uh, the informal sector sa tingin niyo po actually you are in the right track the reason mm. is that more than uh, two thirds of uh, uh, the economy is composed of the informal economy yeah oh, oh. Uh, the uh, the uh, challenge is that uh, a good part of the informal economy is not organized mm. and uh, even the uh, transnational corporations and their partners in developing countries are proposing and advancing the notion that the way to development is to uh, organize this uh, informal sector and make them part of the supply chain of the transnational corporations mm. i can find that in the uh, uh, blueprint of ASEAN, even the Philippine government, you know, uh, they say, okay, let's build the capacity of micro small enterprises so that they can be part of supply chains, of the big companies. You know. So this is their, you know, plan. Uh, ours is, we'll say, no, there are certain groups existing in uh, the informal economy. Uh, there are groups of farmers, a group of fisher folks, folks uh, women, 
uh, indigenous people, but these are, you know, uh, they're doing their own uh, initiatives, but uh, there is no convergence. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is why uh, it's part of the struggle of uh, social social economy, because as we'll see later on, social social economy is both based on the practices of people, at the same time, it is a vision, yeah? So it's a philosophy as well as a philosophy based on the practices of people. But people sometimes don't see the good that they wish. For example, if you ask cooperatives, what kind of economy are you creating? They cannot answer that yeah? because they're focusing on the organization. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Many of the uh, uh, community development workers that I know when I ask that question, what kind of economy are you creating when you're helping communities? They can't answer that, yeah? Because they are focusing on the organization or the project, yeah? The project they're developing that will increase the income of these farmers, uh, this enterprise will increase the income and uh, that's supposed to alleviate poverty of the people, but all these things will not res uh, re re resort into an independent and autonomous economy. Hmm. So you have to re-embed the economy in the local uh, setting, local territories. But at the same time, you have to wake up, you know. Uh, you have to embed in the consciousness of the people that they need. Their problem is not access to finance. Their problem is not access to market. Their problem is they, they lack an economy that is autonomous and independent. So this is why this is my, you know, when, when I'm, I, I encounter debate about access, it's true. Uh, the poor people lack access to finance, lack access to resources, lack access to so many things. But why? What is the root cause? The root cause is that they don't have their own economy. Yeah? And this neoliberal market economy will always deprive them of this access. So... Uh, I, like I said, you are in the right track, uh, right track. Uh, but the challenge really is how do we mobilize? How do we organize the informal economy? Uh, okay. Of course, we will discuss that in later because I have done something, a project. That Thank you, sir. Thank you. We, we, ben, we actually preempted um, the yeah? other parts of your lecture. And then there are other questions here. Maybe we will answer them after. Okay, okay. When you go into the SSE itself. Okay, Paul, please, would you like to continue with your lecture? Okay, I will uh, load, uh, share the, um, the other ano, itong, uh, lecture number two. Yeah. Uh, this is also very short. Lecture number two is entitled The Impact of Neoliberal Policies and Programs, the Philippine Case. So now we're going to uh, the uh, Philippines and we're, we're going to look at, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Pop full screen na lang po. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we're now going to look at uh, how neoliberalism developed in the Philippines, you know. First, uh, uh, we uh, must uh, know that neoliberalism is used to refer to market-oriented... Uh, excuse me, I will have to adjust my screen here. Yeah? Okay. So this is just to refer to market-oriented reform policies, yeah? such as eliminating price controls, deregulating capital markets, lowering trade barriers, reducing state influence in the economy. So it marginalizes the role of the state in the economy. So with this broad framework, how do transnational corporations determine a developing country's development path. We're going to look at the case of the Philippines to understand you know, what the uh, neo-colonial uh, transnational corporations do, you know, developed countries do. Uh, so industrialization is the social and economic transformation of society 
from an agrarian to industrial economy. Okay. Uh, now, the culture of entrepreneurship has been the driver of industrial revolutions and one of the main reasons for Western world to be in the forefront uh, in these industrial uh, revolutions from the first, second, and third. By the end of the third industrial revolution, now there are Asian countries, you know, Japan, China, India, successfully transforming their industries and economies. In 2016, China, Japan, and India had the third, fourth, and seventh rankings in the World Bank Index of National GDP as a share of global GDP. In other words, now uh, by the third industrial revolution, Asia has also followed this path of development that is called industrialization. Now, many emerging economies in Asia pursued industrialization as a means to generate employment, reduce poverty, and reduce inequalities. Now, Musumi Roy, author of Asia's Road in the Fourth for Industrial Revolution, said, the direction of the global economy depends largely on Asia, which holds both its biggest and greatest share of highly educated young workers. The key ingredients for its success include government policies oriented toward economic social openness, prioritizing investment education, innovation, superior technological skills, and above all, enthusiastic partnerships with citizens in welcoming the technologies of the future. So this is the, uh, you know, uh, normal analysis of a person, of uh, uh, analyst uh, who look at uh, the process of development as if nation states st still have, you know, the uh, the control, you know, of their respective economies. Uh, but the classic structural shift from agriculture to industry is absent from the Philippine history. Yeah, instead. Since 1950s, instead the shift has been from subsistence agriculture to subsistence services. So why did the Philippines fail to industrialize? Okay, so uh, now we have to look at both the uh, what the neoliberal market economy has done to the Philippines, as well as what uh, the uh, internal conditions in the country uh, look like that contributed. To this failure. So, just a brief uh, uh, rundown of our uh, history. Between 1898 and 1946, we were, we were under the US colonial rule. 48 years, yeah. So, you can imagine that uh, as a colony, uh, the products from the US were coming to the Philippines free, uh, no tariff, everything, and uh, with those 48 years of dependence on the American economy and uh, being exposed to uh, uh, these uh, stateside goods. Of course, the Filipino people have uh, developed the taste for American goods. Yeah? So what happened after that? You know, after the Second World War, uh, you know, we became independent, quote unquote, but there were treaties and agreements. Yeah between the US and the Philippines that con continued, you know, this dependence of the Philippine economy on the US economy. For example, what is called the uh, Belt Trade Act, and then later on the Lowry Langley Act agreement, the Belt Trade Act ensured free trade with the Philippines for easy access to the country's vast natural resources and allowed unlimited tariff-free entry of American surplus into the domestic market. Tariff free, yeah. So, until as late as 1974, American monopoly capitalists could exploit natural resources and engage in public utilities and other industries as if they were Filipinos. So now, uh, we are uh, by 1970s, uh, our economy has is still controlled by the U.S. Americans, and then. You have the Carino Foster Agreement also, uh, US Up Economic Technical Cooperation Agreement. This, this technical systems agreement were laid down as early as the 1950s, yeah, and then continued in the, in the later part through the USAID. Yeah? And um, okay, uh, they placed advisors in uh, strategic uh, parts of the uh, government, including the 
central bank. So that means to say, uh, uh, they have also advisors in Congress. You know? So that means to say policy making as well as the uh, monetary authorities have uh, American advisors. 1970s and 1980s, the US laid down global economic policy measures during the Marcos dictatorship. Yeah? Uh, and this ushered the implementation of trade investment, liberalization, privatization, deregulation across the country. They started the cheap labor export, export processing zones with repression. The US used IMF and World Bank uh, to pro promote structural adjustment programs to ensure that the neoliberal economic measures were carried out by the Philippine government. So we have gone into 1980s, more uh, uh, policies uh, tying down the Philippine economy. In 1990s, 100% 100 foreign ownership was allowed in most sectors. This was reinforced by the liberalization, the regulation of water transport, telecommunications, banking, shipping, airlines, oil, retail trade, and more others. Neoliberal policies did not bring progress, but instead re reinforced the economy's backward agrarian and pre-industrial character. I mentioned USAID. It plays a major role in crafting Philippine economic policy. Now, we now look into internal forces, internal factors, you know, uh, that uh, enabled, strengthened American control over the Philippine economy. The, the first factor is the perennial political instability, uh, which is tied to the subservience of economic policies to American interests. Political instability and corruption reduce investment demand. Now, corruption was uh, also instilled by the Americans. In the Bill Trade Act, they dumped them $800 million you know, as a payoff for war repatriations if the Philippines will approve the Bill Trade Act. And uh, the, uh, the bribery you know, uh, continued over the years yeah, in the form of a bilateral aid. Yeah. Now, uh, William Sim and they just, uh, they wrote, when the Philippines conformed to the industrial convergence pattern, that means to say, you know, uh, the path towards industrialization, it began to deviate sharply from the pack meaning to say the newly industrial Asian countries up to the 1970s. Indeed, it left the Industrial Catch-Up Club in 1982 following the country's worst post-World War II economic and political crisis. While per capita incomes eventually recovered in the mid-1990s, the Philippines never re-entered the Industrial Growth Club. Instead, services have served, have served as a platform of growth for more than a quarter century. So we missed, yeah? Uh, but what we missed is becoming part, you know, of the uh, industrial supply chain, industrial supply chain of transnational companies. What do I mean by that? For example, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, you know, uh, in so far as car manufacturing is concerned, they became uh, manufacturers, you know, of uh, uh, this uh, Japan, uh, Japan cars, Japanese cars, you know. But still, the market and uh, the patent are controlled by the Japanese uh, uh, companies. The period 1984-1991 was about one of the deepest political crises. And it was also a period of large-scale relocation of Japanese manufacturing to Southeast Asia. This wave of foreign direct investment benefited Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia, and led to the build-up of a significantly export-oriented manufacturing sector in these countries. Owing to political instability, Japanese, Taiwanese, and Hong Kong foreign direct investment largely bypassed the Philippines. So we missed, yeah. That's why we're not able to industrialize. You know? So from uh, subsistence agriculture, we, uh, the Philippine economy, uh, went into subsistence services. Yeah? Okay. Uh, in uh, 1952, uh, Mr. Quaderno wrote, you know, this uh, commentary on the uh, kind of economy that uh, the Philippines was nurturing. You know? 
So you said with the unlimited free imports from the United States, how could we expect to diversify and increase production? How many people are going to raise their capital in new industrial plants for the production of consumer goods if they're continuously threatened by competing duty, free, duty goods from outside? Ask those of our people who have taken this if they are not worried about it. The duty-free import of U.S. goods made possible by Belt Act has served to discourage the investment of foreign capital in the Philippines. What would be the need for American investors to raise capital on manufacturing enterprises in this country if they could more easily make their profits by merely exporting consumer goods to the Philippines? What inducement can be given to foreign capital to invest in this country when domestic producers cannot be afforded adequate protection from the cheap mass-produced goods coming from the United States? Now, you can see how prostrate, frustrated were the uh, nationalist economists of those times, yeah? Because they can see already the kind of uh, colonialist, uh, colonialized economy uh, that uh, the Philippine economy is going to be, yeah? Okay, the next uh, factor is overvaluation of the pe peso. The Bell Trade Act pegged the peso to the dollar to, to is to one. Now, that was re really over... Uh, overvalued, you know. Why? Uh, because that will allow the people, the Filipino people, to buy American goods, yeah, because they have the purchasing power. Yeah? Now, uh, why is it that an overvalued peso is um, um, not good, you know, for the export uh, sector of the economy? It's because uh, it will make our goods more expensive. And cannot compete, you know, with the goods that's coming to the Philippines. Yeah, uh, so this is why an overvalued peso uh, might be uh, good in so far as importing um, importing goods from other countries is concerned, because it uh, appears cheaper, but uh, it also discourages the uh, capacity of the country to produce export goods and export goods uh, you can only export goods when they are processed yeah so it is uh, discouraging ultimately uh, the setting up of processing plants now uh, the fourth factor is overseas migration and OFW remittances high unemployment and lack of decent work opportunities for example, you need a college degree to work at McDonald's for less than 50 cents per hour, with the major push factors why Filipinos are migrating. Overseas remittances have been associated with an unprecedented nominal appreciation of the peso. While OFW remittances have brought economic relief to millions of Filipinos, this also placed the peso under steady pressure to rise in real terms, which leaves little room for lower skilled manufacturing to compete and expand. Economists refer to this phenomenon as the Dutch disease. Now, I'd like uh, you know the PhD students to look this term in Google. Google this. What does Dutch that disease mean? Yeah? Uh, well, in essence, it means to say that you have a good thing, yeah, uh, like uh, remittances, with double remittances, but it leads to a bad thing, yeah. So, sa Tagalog yan, ginto na naging bato pa. Yeah? Uh, so, you look this up, that's this is. Yun ang nangyar, that what's happened with our OFW remittances because while it uh, increased, you know, the value of, uh, keep the uh, value of the peso as strong, it also discouraged manufacturing. Now, the other uh, negative impact of OFW remittances uh, is consumerism. Yeah? Nasanay na sa imported goods. Yeah? And uh, you see, what has happened was that uh, um, instead of manufacturing companies, processing plants uh, sprouting all over the Philippines, it's the shopping malls that's... Uh, you, you can find that all over the Philippines, you know, big shopping malls, yeah, uh, because the Filipinos have been accustomed yeah, for almost a century, yeah, to 
uh, just consume you know, uh, and uh, uh, not produce their own goods. So the question really is, uh, well, this, this author, Jose Ani Rico, you have to, and uh, Kim Robert De Leon, uh, you can access, you know, this article and read very interesting. And they answer the question, why is it that a population that is one of the poorest in Southeast Asia is so obsessed with shopping malls? You know? It has become a culture. You know? uh, imagine uh, almost a century that uh, we have been encouraged uh, to buy imported goods. You know? And uh, we're not even questioning anymore whether we're able to produce our own goods. You know? uh, so. This is why we have missed, you know, uh, the industrialization process and our economy continues to be weak. And uh, now we have jumped from subsistence agriculture to subsistence services. Yeah? Uh, we, we, we skip the industrialization process. Yeah? So uh, for discussion is the question, uh, is the consumerist mindset of Filipinos ultimately disadvantageous to the industrialization of the Philippine economy? Uh, uh, because, of course, uh, uh, when you have a, a population that is uh, consumer-oriented, that is good if, for example, they buy Philippine goods. Yeah? So the, uh, the wealth remains in the Philippines and then it grows. Yeah? Uh, one of the things that I discuss with my my uh, family members, especially my children, you know, I was telling them, I'm not a very good economist, you know, I have not written any book on economics, but what I have observed is this, wherever there are Chinese families in a country, you see that they uh, become, you know, the dominant economic force in that country, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, but why is it in the Philippines, we don't see that. Yeah? So this, these countries, they have grown, they have uh, improved, they have developed, but why is the Philippines uh, become poorer, you know? Uh, so I look at, uh, you know, the uh, uh, culture of Philippine families, even in my own, and I, I tell them, one of the reasons is that, you know, when, uh, let's say, uh, your parent has some assets, yeah? and he has five, seven children. When the parents pass away, the children will divide the assets. Yeah? So what happens to the asset is divided and then become little, 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 and so you create more micro and small enterprises. But those countries which have really built up the economy, many families, they grow, the wealth, the assets that their parents, grandparents have developed over the years. Yeah. So I, I told my children and my, you know, uh, nephews, nieces, yeah, you must learn to build up your asset so that you're able to be autonomous and independent. That kind of uh, culture is not happening in the Philippines. I have interviewed a number of micro enterprises and many of them, their main motivation to go into business is to be able to send their children to school. Once the children have uh, graduated, they also retire and then abandon their enterprises. So what happens? A new generation of poor, they will start again, small micro enterprises. Yeah. And that's all over again. I mean, it's like a forest. You continue to plant new trees. The trees do not grow tall and big. Yeah? And that is what has happened in the Philippines. Yeah? So again, it's uh, embedded in our culture. And then the policy, as well as uh, the uh, regulation, I mean, the uh, uh, programs of the government uh, are so uh, focused you know, on uh, supporting uh, this uh, consumerist uh, uh, culture of the Filipinos. So the question is, is there anything that we can do, you know, to renew, transform the people's mindset from being consumption oriented to becoming more savings investment oriented? Mm -hmm. It's very, very important because uh, 
if, for example, if we continue to depend on World Bank loans, ADB loans, you know, uh, and then our savings are captured by this universal and uh, uh, these um, uh, commercial banks, and 98% uh, of our deposits are captured by them, and they pull this in order to lend this money, offer this money to transnationals and big corporations so that they can exploit the natural resources. So this is the, the case in the Philippines. Yeah. So if we're going to build an alternative economy, we have to develop our own source of uh, funds. Yeah? So this is the question I'd like to ask. And uh, that, will, that ends my second lecture. Now, uh, over to you, Dr. Natsi. Thank you very much, Dr. Quinones. Okay, are there any questions on the second part of Dr. Quinones' lecture? Even comments? Well, I hope, uh, Dr. Natsi, yes. you can facilitate the, the uh, discussion on the questions I raised. Yeah? Uh, okay. Uh, after after uh, the lectures. Yeah? Would you like to proceed to the third and last yeah, part? I proceed the to the third, and then okay. we go to the open forum. Yes, yes, let's do that. Thank you very much, Dr. Quinones. Okay. Now we go to, uh, you know, a potential solution to uh, these uh, problems. Yeah. Uh, so the, the third and last uh, topic of my lecture is the contribution of social economy to decent work and the uh, sustainable development goals. This is only an introduction because uh, the seminar on SSE will focus on this uh, topic, the uh, social solidarity economy. Now, I'd like just to uh, uh, read this quote from Bart Mokboom of Protein Economics. He said, the individual is rooted in the social and that is precisely what economics has lost sight of or never had in sight. And the social is rooted in the local. That is one of two reasons for craving for nationalism, restoration a sense of a sense of local roots. So when you say embed social Sudan economy in territories, this is what it means, you know. You uh, bring back, you know, the economic relations uh, into the locality instead of bringing local initiatives, local economic production processes as part of the supply, global supply chain of the transnational corporations. Now, <clears throat> uh, in order to understand you know, why we have the sustainable development goals, we have to look back into uh, what they did, you know, uh, United Nations did with Millennium Development Goals, because this is supposed to um, provide uh, alternatives to solve, you know, this uh, um, poverty, yeah, lack of access to resources, and so forth. Yeah. Uh, but uh, by uh, 2015, uh, the um, United Nations governments civil society noted that uh, there's still this uh, poverty is still endemic and um, uh, there are uh, shortcomings of the indigenous yeah? so they had this uh, sustainable developments uh, ratified and the uh, rio plus 20 conference in brazil yeah? in 2012 and then it was um, formally uh, agreed upon by the member states of the un in 2015 now, uh, even from this uh, picture alone, you can see that uh, the SDGs uh, tend to have more uh, targets and uh, goals compared to the MDGs. Now, uh, the congruence between SEC and these SDGs uh, is uh, summarized in the form of access and inclusion, meaning to say, it is in these two aspects you know, of action, access to resources and inclusion, 
that ECC and SDGs converge. Yeah? So the rationale for this is place like this. The, the SDG or 2030 agenda promises to leave no one behind. In order to fulfill this promise, those currently left behind need opportunities, security, and empowerment. Now, opportunities, security, and empowerment can be generated through improved access and inclusivity. The ACC plays a critical role in facilitating access and ensuring inclusion. Now, let's pause a while on this particular statement. The ACC plays a critical role in facilitating access and ensuring inclusion. It does not say access and inclusion can be achieved by linking micro and small enterprises to the global supply chains of transnational corporations. That is the existing system right now. Okay, so this is very crucial you know, because it says there is an alternative way of uh, providing, ensuring access and inclusion of poor, marginalized uh, to resources, economic resources. Now, uh, the contributions of ACC entities to access and inclusion related SDG targets need to be highlighted. We have to showcase, you know, we have to bring out to the consciousness of people uh, how are ACC entities creating alternative access and inclusion programs and practices, you know, uh, to marginalize the poor women, uh, indigenous people, and so forth. Yeah? So we need to do this. Instead, you know, of uh, uh, playing into the mantra of transnational corporations that uh, you can really provide access and inclusiveness uh, to the poor and those working, those uh, operating in the informal economy by linking them to the transnational corporations or to, to the neoliberal market economy. Okay, so this is one thing that i like to point out here that uh, the first three statements uh, these are uh, standard, you know, analysis. Yeah, but the fourth and fifth one are really uh, not standard anymore. They are uh, out of the box. Yeah? So uh, the question is why access and inclusion through SSE? Yeah, uh, because the term access appears forty-eight times in the SDG framework often with qualifiers such as equal, fair, universal, or affordable. Creating access through collective action is precisely the role and raising data of the uh, ECC organization's enterprises. They provide access to markets, to finance, to rights, to services, to knowledge, etc. In situations where individuals are powerless and excluded from services rendered by the state and the private sector. The term inclusion or inclusive appears 14 times in the SDG framework, including a vital five goals. It means the social, economic, and political inclusion of all irrespective of age, age, sex, disability, race, ethnicity, origin, religion, or economic other status. SDG organization and enterprises are, by nature, identity, and conviction, better suited to foster inclusivity than other forms of business and social organization. So this is the, uh, uh, you know, um, reason why uh, we are focusing on uh, the uh, uh, concept of access and inclusion of the marginalized, the poor, women, uh, indigenous people, and all those who are excluded, you know, from the mainstream economy. But we are not saying access and inclusion in the supply chains of transnational corporations or the big companies. Yeah. We're saying inclusion and inclusive uh, through the SSE organizations and enterprises. Now, uh, here uh, is uh, the answer to the question a while ago. Uh, is the informal economy going to be the engine uh, for organizing the SEC. Yeah? The informal economy consists of activities of family businesses and settler groups 
that have market value but are not formally registered. Consequently, the activities of self-help groups of women, farmers, fishermen, indigenous people, etc., operating in the informal economy are not reflected in official statistics. Note, the family household is a form of self-help group. Okay, so when you say self-help group, it includes family enterprises or businesses. The informal economy is a global phenomenon. There is great variation within and across countries. On average, it represents 35% of GDP in low and middle income countries versus 15% in advanced countries. The International Labor Organization estimates that about 2 billion, 2 billion workers or over 60% of the world's adult labor force operate in the informal economy. Although the informal economy is central to the economic development process, it is difficult to measure. This is because activities within it cannot be directly observed. And for the most part, participants in the informal economy do not want to be accounted for. So they don't want to be regulated. Now, uh, the SSE uh, supports 23 SDG targets that seek to facilitate access and enhance inclusion. I will just go through this very quickly. In poverty, 1.4, the target 1.4. And the role of SSE is to organize access of, to service through collective action and mutual assistance. Facilitate access to finance through rotating and savings credit associations and credit union. Improve access to ownership through empowerment of individuals forming the SSA entities like separate groups, associations, etc. Hunger. How do SSE uh, uh, provide solution to hunger? Food production and marketing through rural producers organizations. Consumer cooperatives, community-supported agriculture, these are initiatives uh, of uh, SEC organizations. And uh, also, uh, sorry, also the um, uh, activities of marketing co-ops, credit unions, specific co-ops, etc. Hunger, yeah. Uh, sorry, help. So there are mutual health benefit groups, community health schemes, and health co-ops. Actually, this kind of self-help groups and initiatives uh, became aligned and active during the COVID-19 pan pandemic. Yeah. In Thailand, we saw this. In Malaysia, in Indonesia, even in the Philippines. Uh, Community-based organizations uh, came out and provided uh, uh, health services uh, uh, to the people. Education, there are community-based kindergarten, community-organized schools. Gender, formation of women's groups, associations, and cooperatives. Examples, Sewa in India, Patamab in the Philippines, Homnet Producers Cooperative in the Philippines. There are so many uh, examples of this. In fact, it is uh, said that women are in the forefront of social Sudan economy. Yeah? Water. There are community self-help schemes, auxiliary services provided by larger rural co-ops, co like the Oromia Cooperative Federation in Utopia, uh, organizations like ASCII, the uh, Alalay Sekaunalan Incorporated. They have a water uh, dispersal system and they do it through groups, self-help groups in the community so that uh, in the process, uh, the community, organized groups in the community uh, will own and uh, manage uh, the uh, water system. Energy, there are renewable, uh, renewable energy uh, projects initiated by rural electric cooperatives. Um, you have decent work, credit unions, both in savings and uh, good, uh, associations, financial cooperatives. One of the uh, participants of the ASIC ECC course, Prosperity Ongoing, interviewed a, a cooperative. Uh, the uh, farmer's cooperative was actually marketing the produce of the members. Uh, and then one of the issues was uh, the cooperative uh, really don't know whether they're contributing to decent work and to transition from formal to, uh, from informal to formal uh, economy. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I, um, 
sort of um, provide the uh, idea that, uh, for example, there are 50 uh, member farm households and uh, the produce of these 50 farm households are marketed by the cooperative. Now, the cooperative is a registered organization, so it's working in the formal economy. But the household economies of these farm households are in the informal sector. Yeah? So by connecting their business to a formal organization, they're actually transitioning to a formal structure. Yeah? Now, what is the impact on job creation uh, by this process? So I was telling you know, the um, cooperative, assuming that 100% of the production of these farm households are marketed through the formal structure called cooperative. In fact, that cooperative is maintaining the jobs of these farm households. Yeah? That is how it is promoting and upholding decent work in the informal economy. The industry, another is, uh, of course, there are small scale industrial other, and other enterprises. And this is very crucial, you know, uh, because um, the uh, striving of uh, uh, small micro enterprises to do processing, yeah, like our cocoa sugar, yeah, uh, many other process, uh, processing uh, uh, facilities and initiatives. These are done by cooperatives. Yeah? Uh, so uh, we have to focus more on you know, the organized uh, action of people that is geared towards uh, processing uh, products that are meant you know, for consumption locally uh, so that uh, these processed products will have longer uh, how do you call this um, uh, longer uh, gestation you know in the market uh, compared to primary uh, products equality uh, this uh, quality or this uh, feature of equality is um, manifested you know in the open membership principle of the social economy like the cooperative as well as to empowerment through collective action and vertical integration. So for example, the federations of cooperatives where the primary cooperatives are represented, they had uh, uh, one organization, one vote, but now also the trend that, uh, you know, uh, the uh, voting power of primary cooperatives uh, will become dependent on how much is the capital share in the federation is also uh, happening. Yeah? And settlements, there are housing subtract groups, association informal transporters, uh, and uh, there are also taxi cooperatives. Grab is like, very much like a taxi cooperative. Yeah? But of course, it has a uh, capitalist uh, uh, features. Okay, oceans. There are fishery co-ops and separate groups, and there are advo advocacy groups that promote the rule of law, uh, national and international level. Okay, so with this, uh, the uh, issue for discussion is uh, this statement. Yeah? Strengthening the ECC features of separate groups, associations, community-based organizations operating in the informal economy will help boost progress towards achieving the SDGs. Yeah. So why is it that we state it this way? Yeah? Uh, why is it that we link SSE to SDGs? Because we are promoting the concept nationally as well as globally. Yeah? We need partners, you know, both local, regional, and international to help support and push this agenda. Uh, it is already advantageous that the ILO, UN Task Force, ACSE, even UNDP, OECD, uh, they are promoting ACSE. And very soon, it is expected that the UN General Assembly will put into the agenda the adoption of ACSE, you know, insofar as 
accelerating the progress of the achievement of SDGs. Yeah? Because the midterm 2025 is getting here, and yet the public sector and the private sector have not uh, achieved so much. Yeah? Whereas in the informal economy, the self-help groups, SEC organization enterprises, they are doing this already. Yeah? Uh, they are contributing to SDGs. So recognition of these initiatives, uh, merely by recognizing these initiatives at the grassroots level, is already a means of boosting uh, the uh, progress towards achieving the SDGs. Yeah? So with this argument, we can now uh, you know, proceed with more initiatives and vigorous moves to really uh, develop, strengthen SSEs. Yeah? Okay, with this, uh, Dr. Natsi, I uh, end my lecture and uh, over to you for the discussion. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Dr. Quinones, please leave this slide. Yes. Yeah, so that we can use it as a jump off point for our discussion. But I think very important to highlight in this question is that there are self-help groups, cooperatives, associations, community-based organizations, etc., that already have SSE features. Because I also learned that in my own dissertation journey where I studied women in the informal economy and their enterprises. So they did not know that they were actually SSE enterprises already, or they had features or characteristics that were um, that mirrored the values and practices of SSE. Okay, so should we open also the floor to questions, Dr. Quinones? Yeah, uh, I have not uh, no consolidated them, uh, yes, but I will open the other, you know, other, uh, how do you call this, presentations. Yeah. But be, while they're thinking, there's a question here. Yeah. Chat box from a previous part of your lecture. This is from Tintin Palomo. Okay. Do you have any example of cooperation between state, the public, and the private sectors and groups? towards economic sovereignty. It can be either domestic or abroad. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, so far as that is concerned, actually we have to look at the uh, examples of social sadat economy being globalized. Yeah? Because when you globalize SSE, it takes partnership. And uh, that is actually part of my lecture uh, in the near future. And there are examples already like free trade movement, consumer, uh, community supported agriculture. Yeah. And there are international organizations working, you know, uh, all over the world. And uh, they're not only uh, working with organized groups of farmers, organized groups of, of uh, fish, fish or folk, folks, women. They're also work, working with local governments. Yeah? So, uh, in Europe, uh, there are already countries where the government has set up a uh, Ministry of Social Sudat Economy. Yeah? Belgium, France, among them. Yeah? Uh, uh, Brazil is one. Yeah? So in other words, uh, this is, uh, I mean, so far as uh, partnership between civil society, uh, working with um, ACC organization enterprises at the local level and the government, as well as uh, private companies, yeah, uh, is uh, this, these are happening in many parts of the world. Yeah? But in Asia, this concept of social sadat economy is very new. Yeah? What is widespread and more uh, popular in Asia is the concept of social enterprise. Now, ASEC is also part of this uh, social entrepreneurship uh, development roadmap in the Philippines. And um, uh, it, it promotes the partnership, not only of uh, civil society, but also a formal organizations like cooperatives, foundations, uh, NGOs, academe, and uh, government agencies, yeah? as well as uh, private companies. Yeah? So there are initiatives like this, but again, the focus really is on the enterprise, on the uh, organization. Uh, 
when I first met the uh, promoters of the social enterprise development roadmap uh, and asked them, what, what kind of economy are you promoting, you know, with social, your kind of social enterprise? Again, they could not answer that. Yeah. So this is really one thing that uh, uh, has to be uh, addressed. That's why in my lectures, I always use the analogy of trees and the forest. Trees comprise the forest, but the forest is greater than the sum of all the trees that thrive in it. Why? Because there are also insects, amphibians, there are uh, 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 you know, birds, plants, shrubs, water system. There are many things, you know? and there, there are advantageous uh, objects there, creatures, they're also uh, harmful, insects so the forest is everything but the forest thrives you know? the same thing with enterprise and economy when you talk about enterprise without look at the economy you will you're missing a lot yeah you're missing a lot because uh, then you see when you talk about ECC enterprises and organizations you begin to think oh how can I do that when there is this middle market economy the dominant economy how can it exist yeah it can it can uh, so uh, this is why whenever you go out and organize in community uh, do your community organizing work you have to always be in your mind what kind of economy am i going to promote among these people promote i mean uh, embed in their consciousness you know so uh, this is the uh, thing and with that even the local government yeah and some private companies might understand, you know, the necessity of this approach. Yeah? Uh, I have encountered several, uh, uh, again, you know, I know ASCII is doing this, connecting, you know, with the private sector as well as the government. The uh, uh, Payoga Kapatagan Multipurpose Cooperative in Nueva Vizcaya, they're also doing that. They're into uh, organic farming. And uh, they have mobilized the entire community. Uh, and uh, they were, you know, consulted by the government because the, they needed a champion uh, in their province that uh, is undertaking uh, uh, climate change, uh, I mean, actions against climate change. So uh, there are many initiatives that can be cited where ACC organization enterprises are connecting with private companies and also with the agencies. Uh, of course, local, regional, global, it is happening. And uh, in, in the subsequent, subsequent lectures that I'll be conducting, we'll be discussing concrete cases, you know, uh, concrete cases. And when you undertake this initiative at a uh, uh, community level, it is inevitable that you, um, come across private companies and also local government agencies. So uh, that's why, like I said, we have this mindset of ACSE, you resist and build. Yeah, you build and resist. So uh, with this kind of mindset, if we have community organized with this kind of mindset, then, you know, uh, slowly, gradually, we're able to uh, win over government agencies, local government agencies, and private companies supporting this uh, initiative. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Quinones. Two very important points. Sometimes we focus on enterprise development without mm -hmm. thinking why we are developing the enterprises. Because if we do not look at the larger context of trying to create an alternative economy, we will be pegged on just maximizing profits within a neoliberal framework. Mm. People forget that eh? even as you said in our um, national social enter, enter national social entrepreneurship development framework, mm. no, they don't talk about the larger economy. No? They talk about enterprises. Yes. And then the second very important point also is how we should also advocate the SSE, not just in the social sector, but also in the private and public sectors, because what we want to do is to really mainstream this yes. alternative economy, you know, to convince people that this mm -hmm. is the way to run an economy you know, in a people-centered, also environmentally um, friendly 
way. Kuya Ben, there are questions here in the chat box. I'll yes. just read them yes. no, in the interest of time. Uh, one from Telma Maguro. Uh, yes. Sir Ben, you mentioned about cooperatives. We have yes. the CDA, the Cooperative Development Authority in the Philippines. How do we engage them in the promotion of SSEs? Okay. Because we assume that cooperatives are the ideal model, diba? Yes. SSE enterprise. So are we actually engaging with the CDA already? Okay, that's a good question. Huh? Uh, first and foremost, uh, the um, uh, cooperative really is the classical model of an SSE organization enterprise. Uh, unfortunately, they also don't know what kind of economy they are creating. They are mimicking corporate uh, companies, you know, how they can be more efficient to generate more, more efficient and uh, more profit, yeah, more profitable. Uh, and even our planners, you know, uh, even researchers, when you ask them what is the objective of um, engaging the farmers, it's to increase their income, yeah? increase income. It's a profit-oriented kind of uh, perspective. Now, engaging with CDA. We have tried it, you know, several times. But CDA is so regulation oriented. They are not development oriented. So uh, this is really a challenge because even uh, the previous uh, CDA director, uh, who is a good friend of mine, uh, he was, you know, uh, promoting ECC already in Palawan when they had a conference there. We have a, uh, how do you call this, a... Um, Declaration, you know, declaring that the cooperative uh, movement, you know, will adopt SSE as uh, a framework, you know, for development. Yeah, but uh, uh, there were no concrete steps taken by uh, uh, that director, you know, of CDA uh, to really cascade and uh, propagate, promote SSE. Yeah. So um, it was probably more a political uh, step or move and uh, uh, nothing happened from it. You know? uh, so this is the, uh, the um, case right now. But of course, if there is opportunity through this initiative of the uh, Bayan Academy, they will, they will have the social enterprise, social entrepreneurship development roadmap summit uh, so Philippines Enterprise Summit yeah, in February 23-24, they have, uh, at least the organizers, they have uh, embraced, you know, the concept of SSE uh, and uh, they have given us a slot, you know, to um, promote SSE in that, uh, uh, in that summit. Yeah. And this uh, initiative of this uh, roadmap, uh, all sectors are represented, private sector, the cooperative sector in civil society sector, uh, the government sector, and the academy you know, are represented there. So Dr. Natsi and I are part of that. Patamaba is part of that. ASCII is part of that, you know. So we have that, uh, we have that uh, opportunity to promote. And hopefully the cooperative sector, you know, will begin to realize that uh, they need really uh, to think about the kind of economy they would like to establish in the Philippines. Yes, thank you, Dr. Kinyo. Pero binabangga natin yung neoliberal paradigm, eh. which brings me to the question of Tintin. Is there a conceptual framework or social development theory that aligns with our SSE? Or do you have your own? And she's no. asking this in relation to the economy that we are trying to create this people-centered economy. Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, uh, if, you, uh, if you read, you know, uh, the literature and sociology, yeah? um, for example, Polanyi, um, he is uh, actually hinting, you know, of uh, what is called embedding economy in the local setting, yeah? So that is what SSE is trying to do because uh, the neoliberal market economy is not really rooted in local uh, settings. Yeah? 
There are many authors. Um, they refer to Ubuntu. Do you know Ubuntu in Africa? Yeah. But they don't know the term SSE, social society economy. So uh, there's so many writings out there, yeah, uh, that um, outline an alternative. Uh, what, for example, the World Social Forum calls an other world. Yeah? Uh, but really, you have to concretize it. You know uh, what this concept and practice of ECC is doing is actually uh, bringing out you know concrete practices of people at the grassroots, and then providing that with an umbrella conceptual framework of how it would look like if, for example, this convergence of ECC organizations at the local level, at the national level, regional, international level. Right now, many of our cooperatives, our separate groups, do not know the concept. That is why what I uh, initiated in our ECC course in ASIC in the UP Guided Social Work is to have a self-assessment of the core features of an ECC. Because as I always uh, say, you cannot find something if you don't know what you're looking for. You cannot find SSE if you don't know what an SSE organizational enterprise looks like. What are the features? Yeah. So this is very basic. It's very basic. Uh, it's like, you know, if you like to establish the kind of forest, let's say I'd like to establish a pine tree forest, a pine forest. Yeah. So you have to understand what kind of what kind of a tree is a pine pine tree in order to create a pine forest. So these two are interrelated. That is why uh, in the uh, roadmap, social enterprise development roadmap, I place there that ASEC will be uh, spearheading. You know the. Uh, um, the um, uh, identification you know, or mapping of social society enterprises or entities in the Philippines using this uh, self-assessment questionnaire. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, making that available to this bigger initiative so that uh, we can link you know, these enterprise organizations uh, and have access to uh, resources. Thank you very much. There's a question here about the present or the poverty reduction through social entrepreneurship bill. Does mm -hmm. it already take into account the context of the SSE? And then also may dagdag po. Thank you, Sir Ben, for the lecture. See you at the Philippine SE Summit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, present bill uh, was structured that way because Social enterprise is relatively well known uh, by the people in the Okay, uh, it's a well known already. Yeah. Uh, so imagine if you propose a bill uh, proposing a um, framework law on social society economy. Uh, there will be a lot of uh, senators and congressmen uh, who will not respond because they don't know what is SSE. Yeah? So in other words, uh, uh, to me, pushing the present bill is a step forward. You know? Because uh, social enterprise is one of the uh, uh, SSE organization uh, that can uh, promote social that economy in this country. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that needs to be done is really to open the eyes of social enterprises. What other features they need to develop in order that they can contribute to SSE in so far as its contribution also to access and inclusion is concerned. Yeah. So, uh, I think this is the uh, role that ASEC can play in this uh, national development roadmap of social enterprises. You know, so to me, uh, 
ASIC should support this initiative, you know, or uh, the uh, um, ratification of uh, enactment into law of the present bill. This is a step forward. You know? And uh, with, with, uh, with that kind of uh, enactment of the bill, there will be more consciousness of identifying social enterprises, supporting social enterprises. And that provides us a window, a big window of opportunity to also promote the concept of the economy that social enterprises are supposed to create. Yeah. So it's a step forward for me. Thank you very much, Kuya Ben. I'm also mindful of the times. It's 7.25. Maybe we have room for what, just one question or two questions from uh, no, JR and also from Lou. Tin, baka you can take up that question na lang later in the semester. <laughs> okay, so si JR po. Sabi niya, the neoliberal market economy has its own measures of development, diba? GDP, GDP per capita, etc. What are SSE's measures of development? Indicators of development of yes, SSE. SSES, how do we know that we are developing? Well, that's why we're we are connecting it or relating it to SDGs, you know, because mm -hmm. the Sustainable Development Goals also have targets. Yeah? And uh, our proposition is that we focus on targets that are oriented towards access and inclusion. This is what I was uh, trying to say a while ago, that SSE contributes, you know, to SDG targets that are oriented towards access and inclusion. Yeah? So these are the indicators that we can use you know, uh, to measure the progress of SEC entities. Uh, it's not only GDP, but uh, well, oh, the SDGs, for example, in the first place was uh, were created because uh, GDP as a measure of development is very limited. It's only about economic, you know, uh, whereas uh, SDG is encompassing social, environmental, economic, and cultural. You know? So even peace and partnership. You know? So this is why uh, the broader scope of indicators for development is provided by SDG. So we're connecting uh, SSE to that. You know? Okay, and then may part two po yung tanong niya. Eh. There are development alternatives that are carried out within the current hegemonic neoliberal market economy, and they sometimes perpetuate it, it, no? And there are also, quote unquote, alternatives to development that counter the current conception of what development is. So would you consider SSE a development alternative or is it an alternative form maybe of development? Meaning, is it a post-development concept? Yung post-development, well, parang development is dead yan eh. <laughs> there is an underlying assumption on that question, you know, because the concept of development so far in the traditional uh, literature is growth, yeah, perpetual growth. You have to grow your GDP, and in uh, the micro uh, uh, micro aspect, it means you have to be always have profit, you know, because profit is an indicator of growth, yeah. So this is why when you say development, you have to define what you mean by it. Yeah, you have to. I mean, uh, that's why I'm, I'm uh, looking at the assumption behind this concept of development because we say alternative development. What are you referring to? Yeah, alternative to what kind of development? Yeah. So in the context of SSE, development means using the growth aspect of development represented by surplus and profit for purposes of funding, supporting your social environmental mission. Yeah. Development in the traditional way, uh, in the uh, capitalist and uh, neoliberal market way, you need to generate uh, profit in order that you reward the owners of capital. Yeah. So that is one development. Yeah. If that's the kind of development you are saying, of course, this is not the kind of development that... Um, we are referring to, yeah. Uh, the alternative development that we're referring to uh, is not to reform, yeah. It's not to uh, sort of uh, try to tinker on this uh, neoliberal market economy uh, to in the hope that uh, it can be better, yeah. 
in fact, the indigenous and indigenous, there are no people or uh, forces uh, that are making use of this also in order that, you know, they can present a capitalism with a human face, quote unquote. Yeah. So uh, there are, of course, uh, there are uh, people, especially in the UN, uh, who are doing that. So this is why uh, you have to really uh, be very sure about. Uh, your concept of development, whether you call it alternative or what, but you have to define what this is. In the, in the context of ECC, we are very, very clear you know, in saying that development is really the, not, uh, not only the creation of surplus, but most important, the use of surplus for purposes of supporting, uh, enlarging you know, uh, the uh, uh, scope of as achieving the social and environmental mission. Yeah. So that is the kind of development we're after. Okay, only one last question, Dr. Quinones. This is yeah. from Lou Tangi. How do you see the future of SSE or our, our SSE movement 10 years from now? Because you have been in this journey for many decades. Yeah, that's a good question. Huh? Because when I started promoting SSE in the year 2000, really there was nothing in uh, uh, in uh, uh, in Asia yet, you know. But now uh, we have partners in 20 countries, you know, promoting this. And in June 2021, for the first time in the history of the ILO, the International Labour Conference adopted a universal definition of SSE. That's a, you know, a, a really breakthrough. Huh? And then we're expecting the UN General Assembly, probably this June, to adopt, you know, uh, SSE for purposes of accelerating progress towards achievement of SDGs. Now, this is, uh, you know, big step forward. 10 years from now, well, that is beyond 2030, yeah? That's 2033. We're expecting even before that, you know, uh, that is, is it became, be, will be mainstream because people will be scrambling, you know, for uh, approaches, strategies, how they can accelerate progress to SDGs. Yeah? In fact, within two years, by 2025, I can see. I mean, I can, I can, you know, uh, see in my mind that uh, governments will be scrambling, you know, for. Uh, ways and means to improve their access, uh, I mean, the achievement of this. In the forum of uh, UNSCAP I attended in uh, Bangkok last December, this was the, the issue, yeah? So I was telling them that uh, the case of Thailand, Vietnam, Singapore, in Thailand, there are 116,000 social enterprises, but then, the registered social enterprises, the ones recognized by the government because it's registered, is only, I think, 150 or 160. Yeah? So I would say, telling them, the best way to accelerate progress towards is, uh, achieving SDG is to recognize the 116,000 social enterprises because they are doing it already. Yeah? Recognize them, document them, you know, uh, highlight them, and then support them then you immediately accelerate progress towards SDGs. Yeah? This is the, uh, uh, the thrust of ASEC's uh, uh, promotional work you know, at the regional level, because now we are part of the regional network established by the UN Task Force in SSE and UN ESCAP to promote SSE in Asia Pacific. Yeah? So uh, yes, 10 years from now, I can see that um, there will be more uh, people who are aware of SSE, more people working, you know, for the development and strengthening of SSE and SSE entities, and more people understanding what the kind of economy SSE is. Yeah, and I hope that the UP College Social Work and Community Development will really promote this concept, you know, because uh, it's called economics in UP. Uh, they are promoting the new labor market economy. Yeah? So as a counterpoint for that, 
uh, I think we should seriously consider uh, making this uh, course, uh, offering this course to students uh, in UP so that you'll have uh, an opportunity to uh, spread this uh, in other uh, universities. Because when the young people catch us, you know, the concept, they are the, the best uh, agents of change, you know, in so far as promoting uh, ideas are concerned. Yes, that really gives us cause for optimism. Thank you for that response, Dr. Quinones. I'm sorry, but we don't have enough time. It's 7.35. But I understand that this class will be open to interested participants throughout the semester. Am I right? Please correct me, Justin and Dr. Quinones. Dr. Justin, can you reply? Because, because after this lecture, people might be interested in learning more. Am I right, Justin? Um, yeah, yeah. The concept is that uh, we'll be opening opening it to the partners, NGO partners, who are interested to join the class. Because that's part of our SSE practice. <laughs> we have to share our knowledge yes. as part of our advocacy work. So thank you very much, thank Dr. You. Quinones. Thank you to all our participants. Before we leave, we need to award our certificate of our appreciation to Dr. Ben Quinones. And I'm going to flash the certificate because like I mentioned earlier, this is a college week activity of the College of Social Work and Community Development. And because of that, we have this for Dr. Quinones. This won't be happening in every session of your class. And I'll post pa yung ano, it is just yung a special power so the if I may read the certificate, Miss Nancy. Yes. Pa stop mo na yung PowerPoint para makita ah, Hindi pa ba nakikita? I'm so sorry. Okay, again, again. Ah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. My screen. So can you see it? Is it visible to yep. everyone? Okay. So certificate of appreciation. The certificate is given to. Benjamin R. Quinones, Jr., Ph.D., for sharing his invaluable knowledge as a lecturer on accelerating progress towards the SDGs through the social solidarity economy at the Doctor of Social Development Program Lecture Series during the CSWCD College Week 2023, held on February 20 to 24, 2023. Given this 20th day of February, hindi naman tayo sa Bulwagan Tangdang Sora. Pero, SWCD virtually po ito, University of the Philippines, Diliman, Quezon City, signed Associate Professor Paul Edward N. Muego, DSD, who is our college secretary, Professor Lenore P. De La Cruz, our dean, and Associate Professor Justin Francis Leon Nicolas, PhD, who is the director of our DSD program. So, pagbati... Congratulations. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Dr. Quinones, for you. sharing your knowledge with us. And we hope that you will take care of your health you. because you have to be yeah. around to see this advocacy to <laughs> full fruition. And you've Thank been working for Thank many, you. many long years. Yes. So with that, uh, we thank all our participants for attending this class slash webinar. And you are welcome to attend the next sessions, which are held every Monday from 5.30 to 8.30. And the link will be available. Well, it will be the same link. Am I correct, Justin? Okay. Yeah. 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 No Permit registration. Ma. So there's no need to register anymore if you want to join the session. Ah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Okay. So please, please do so. Because this is an unfolding <laughs> journey about the SSE. And I'm sure it will be very edifying for all of us. So with that, thank you very much. Justin, do you want to close this session? Print screen, print screen. Ah, ay, so tika muna, kailangan pala ako mag, ano, mag, mag, ano, mag take ng photo, sabi ni Justin. Meron ako. <laughs> director. Okay, I'm now going to take photos po yeah. of everyone. If everybody will kindly open their cameras, only if you are presentable and if you are willing. Wala naman tong ano. Okay, on my count po, I'm going to count. Okay, one, page one lang po ito. One, two, three. Smile please.
Okay, now I'm going to take a screenshot of the second page. Please continue to smile because you might be on this page as well. One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Justin, do you want to close the session? Yes, I guess so. Maraming uh, salamat, Dr. Canyones. Maraming salamat din Nancy for being our moderator for tonight. I would also like to invite you no, tomorrow night, uh, on-site naman ito, we have another lecture. We will have two lectures, uh, Willie Awitan and uh, Erwin Banyas, no? both from the DSD. So if you're around uh, UP, you could uh, visit us no, sa seminar room. Okay, and of course, in the succeeding uh, weeks, as uh, Nazi mentioned, no? uh, introduction pa lang po ito. No? So, <laughs> marami pong pag-uusapan sa SSE. So, marami pa pong kadugtong ito. Ayan. Ayan po yung ayan yes. uh, event bukas. We hope that you can also join this lecture number two of our series. Yeah. Ayan po. Sige. Okay. Oh, meron, pa, meron tayo mga nasa YouTube, no? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Thank uh, you for joining us. And you can always come back to listen to this lecture because it's been recorded. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. Right. Have a good Maram evening. Salamat. And thank you. Good yeah. evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Bye. Bye.